birding these days is more popular than ever. Um, birding used to really be considered a hobby for maybe the elderly or the really nerdy, uh, but today there are more than 47 million bird watchers in the US and that's about 15% of the population. So this is a surprisingly large hobby. It's constantly growing in popularity among all age groups. Uh, and today, especially after the pandemic, when people were looking for excuses to go outside, it's growing in popularity every single year. So there are some people who might disagree with me out there, but I believe that if you enjoy watching birds, that makes you a birder. You don't have to buy fancy binoculars or equipment to claim that title. We're all here because we love birds and we love to watch them. And that being said, being able to identify bird species you see is a really great skill and having a good field guide is the first step to identifying all of those bird species. So there are a ton, a ton of field guides out there. All of them have positives and negatives, but we're going to cover some of the more popular ones. And a caveat before we continue, these are all modern guides we're talking about. So lots of people have older classics and that is perfectly fine. They're still a really, really great resource, but be aware that birds often go through things like name changes. So for instance, if you have an older book, you might see a bird called the rufous sided toey, um, but now it's called the Eastern toey. So just something to be aware of if you're using uh, older vintage guide. So the first guide we're gonna talk about is this Peterson field guide to birds. This is a really common choice and it's a really good choice. It's a really nice little field guide to have. This guide uses art drawings instead of actual birds to depict their uh, most common molts that you'll see the birds in. Some people prefer the drawings over the actual pictures since these often re uh, represent more of an idealized version of birds. Um, and sometimes that can make it easier to point out plumage characteristics. Uh, so what, what, um, what type of feather they're in at the time. Now this next guide, the Sibley guide is very similar. I mean, it has even more visual angles. So many of the birds in the Sibley guide are also depicted in flight, which can be really, really useful depending on how you're birding. So a lot more detail in this book, but depending on what you're doing, this can be a great choice. Now, the Sibley guide is also similar, um, or the Crossley guide, uh, sorry, Crossley guide. And this book focuses more on the actual images of birds instead of the art. Um, some people prefer this. So it has um, art, like actual pictures of birds. And it has some really cool ID quizzes included as well, like this image of the hawks, so you can test your ID knowledge. All of these guides are really, really excellent choices. You can't really go wrong choosing a bird guide. And I'll say here also that there are a wide variety of field guide apps available for your phone. These are also really fantastic choices. They have a ton of their own advantages, but I always recommend starting out with a hard copy field guide. Uh, partly because of how they're divided into groups. So physical guides are a really great way to learn relationships and groupings of different bird species. Now, birding is so popular these days that it's made it into a blockbuster movie. Even though this one is a little older, uh, the 2011 movie, The Big Year, I'm sure some of you have seen it. Um, if you haven't, I definitely recommend it. It's pretty funny. Um, and if you have, and you're maybe new to birding, um, don't worry if you've seen this movie. It is surprisingly accurate um, of how competitive a big year can be. So that's when birders try to see how many species they can see in a single year and try to break the previous records. Um, but you don't have to have a big year or even a big day to just enjoy birding. All right, so let's talk about what kinds of birds we can expect to find here in Indiana and when to look for them. So Indiana is actually positioned in the perfect place to bird. It's right in the path of what we call the Mississippi Flyway. So when migrating, birds often like to follow geographical features. And in this case, they follow the coastlines of Lake Michigan. So what this does is, is it acts like a funnel. So during spring and fall migrations, hundreds of bird species and millions of individual birds are flying right through our state. So due to this, over 420 species have actually been recorded in Indiana, which is a pretty big number. Um, this includes some species you're not very likely to see. Um, so birds well outside of their normal ranges, they usually only stick around for a short period of time. We call these vagrants. So birds like the purple gallinule, which has a few records in Indiana, most recently in 2010 near Laporte, or the roseate spoonbill, which was seen recently in 2020 near Bloomington. 
And both of these species tend to be found to the south. So it's relatively common for them to come up north a little bit and hang out in Indiana. Um, however, birds like the golden crown sparrow is a western species and it has very few records in Indiana, last spotted in 2020 near Patoka Lake. One last vagrant that's really cool is the Anna's hummingbird. It's another western species, but only one has ever been recorded in Indiana. So in the winter of 2020 to 2021, it hung out for several months visiting a hummingbird feeder in Highland. It braved the winter for several months before migrating on. So because of our location along this flyway, we can expect to see several of these vagrant species every year. Now you don't have to go out and memorize, flip through your book and look at what all of these possible visitors might look like. Knowing your common Indiana species can help you identify these birds too. So if you come across a bird that looks something like this, um, you'll know your say ruby-throated hummingbird well enough to know that you're looking at something special, even if you're not 100% sure of what it is. Now, birding in our region can present a lot of challenges. Because of our position along this flyway, we often see species that look differently in the spring versus the fall. So in spring, this time of year, birds are usually in what we call their breeding plumages, um, usually brightly colored, very contrasted, and they're strikingly different from each other, like this black pole and this bay-breasted warbler. It would be really, really confusing, um, really, really difficult to confuse these two birds on a spring day. In the fall, however, things can get a little tricky. So that black pole warbler and that bay-breasted warbler have molted in their non-breeding plumage, and now they look almost identical to the point where there's even a name for this. Birders will often see one of these species, be unable to exactly ID it, and they'll call it a bay pole warbler. So never fear, with a little practice, you'll be able to pick out key identification marks, things like that orange feet on the black pole warbler or the chestnut wash on the bay-breasted, and you'll be able to ID even the trickiest fall warbler species. Now let's talk a little bit about different seasons in Indiana. Uh, right now, the spring is a really, really incredible time to go outside and bird. Our local birds are singing, they're starting to defend territories, and we have this incredible array of migrant species stopping here in Indiana on their way north. This is a really great time to visit local birding hotspots and catch a glimpse of maybe a migrating Canada warbler or a black Bernian warbler, maybe a clay colored sparrow on their way north. Maybe you'll hear the red shouldered hawks screeching at each other while they're building their nest, or if you're lucky, you might even catch a glimpse of a secretive long eared owl as it leaves its winter vacation in Indiana for its breeding grounds up north. In this time of year, south winds are bringing new birds every day. And spring is really one of the most exciting times to bird. You never know what you're going to see. In the summer, things slow down a little bit, but birding at this time can be just as rewarding as birding during migration. Birds are really defending their territories, they're nesting, eggs are starting to hatch, which is always exciting to see. A local prairie warbler might be returning and nesting on its breeding grounds. You might spot an eagle nest, which are usually the size of small cars occupied up in a tree. Or you may be able to see some of our colonial nesting species like gulls and herons in really great numbers. Summer, of course, eventually turns into fall. And again, we can expect to see waves of new species as they migrate through Indiana back on their way south. One of the greatest spectacles in fall is the migration of sandhill cranes. So a huge majority of the Eastern population of sandhills actually travels through Indiana in the fall. And you can hear their bugling cries as they pass overhead. Keep an eye out while you're driving through cornfields for the massive groups of these birds that gather to spend the night together, or plan a trip up to Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area, which has a dedicated crane viewing spot. And going in the fall is a fantastic time to see this really incredible spectacle. Now, winter birding has its own set of birds, and some of our northern breeding birds that spend their winters here in Indiana, we can expect to see. Uh, we often expect to see different gull species like this great black-backed gull, very different from our ring-billed gull and much larger. We may see common loons in their winter plumage, or we might get lucky and experience an eruption of winter finches like this evening grosbeak. Now there are tons of excellent tools available to help you choose a new birding location and to keep track of all of those birds you're seeing. So the Indiana Birding Trail is a fantastic resource for discovering new birding spots across the state. And there's an updated checklist available on the Indiana Audubon website, so you can print it off and bring it with you to keep track on your birding adventures. 
The checklist will not just help you keep track, but every bird has information on how likely it is to be seen at different seasons. So this makes it a really useful tool for knowing what birds you might be expecting to see. So we've talked a little bit about where and when to bird in Indiana and some resources to help you do just that, but let's dig into this, some of the common birds that we might see. So we're gonna move through some of the most common bird families or groups alphabetically, um, but getting familiar with these bird families is a really great way to begin your birding adventure. So if you're familiar with families and some of their characteristics, you'll be able to narrow down your ID when looking at unfamiliar birds. So even if you're not sure of the species. So first up, we have the herons and the egrets, a really cool group of birds. This group can often be found near water since most of our common species in this group prefer fish as a meal, although they often won't say no to a small frog or even a small mammal either. These guys have really long bills for catching things in water, long legs and toes for wading and perching, and they can be often found in summer nesting together in really, really large colonies. The gray blue heron is our largest and heaviest heron with this gray blue body and a um, black head plume. So those feathers coming off the back of his head. Um, these birds can often be, saw, be seen wading quietly along the edges of ponds as they fish. Now the green heron, on the other hand, the bird in the middle, is very small and stocky, and it's usually strikingly green and brown. Unlike the great blue heron, the green heron will often perch and hunt from branches or vegetation overhanging the water, so much smaller. Now the great egret is very similar in shape to that great blue heron, but it's bright white instead with a yellow bill and black legs. You'll notice that the great egret doesn't have any plumes on their head like the heron, and in the summer breeding um, birds' faces will become a deep jewel green color. So it's very cool to see them when they're in their breeding plumage. Next up, we have waterfowl, the ducks. So many of you are probably familiar with birds um, in this family like the mallard, but a more rarely seen species is the wood duck. The species is pretty secretive. It's really hard to sneak up on. So if you're ever walking past a small pond in the woods and you see a duck flying away from you and crying as it flies away, a good guess is the wood duck. The males of the species are incredibly colorful and they actually nest in trees or duck boxes. So these guys prefer to nest in what we call cavities. The female will incubate her eggs in a high cavity nest and the babies have to jump out of their nest to reach the water when they hatch. So they have a rough start in life. Our next group is the sandpipers and the plovers. So one of the most commonly encountered birds from this family is the killdeer, and it's named for their call, which sounds a bit like killdeer, killdeer, killdeer. These birds often make nests called scrapes, which is exactly what it sounds like, a little scraped bowl and sand or gravel, in which they lay very, very well camouflaged eggs. Killdeer often make these nests in gravel parking lots, which is not the safest nesting place. But you'll know if a killdeer is nesting nearby if you see an adult performing a broken wing display. And that's where they pretend to have a broken wing to lure predators or birders away from their nest. The piping plover is another bird in this family, although much less common. They're listed as endangered in the Great Lakes region. However, they're making a really fantastic comeback. So you might be familiar with the famous Monty and Rose, who have nested for several years now at Montrose Beach in Chicago. And with some really fantastic volunteer efforts and programs helping these birds, it's only a matter of time before we see a piping plover nest here in Indiana. Nope, oh, and there's a baby killed here. Now this next group is a few families together, but together they're commonly referred to as raptors. So hawks, eagles, vultures, and falcons. The red-tailed hawk is a large species of raptor, and it can usually be seen perching high while it searches for food with its really excellent vision. And just like their name, adults have bright red tails. That's not always common in juveniles. Young red-tailed hawks usually have striped tails, but the adults will have those really bright, striking red tails. Turkey vultures, who are the cleanup crew of the animal world, can often be seen soaring high above up in the air, catching thermals as they move. Um, if you don't spot them down on the ground on the side of a road, cleaning up roadkill. So they serve a really useful purpose. And the American kestrel, our smallest falcon species, can often be sighted perching on low power lines or at the tops of small trees, searching for their next meal, a mouse or maybe even a grasshopper. 
Now on to the pigeons and the doves. So while we may occasionally see other dove species in Indiana, the mourning dove is by far the most common. It's named for its cooing, melancholy call, and this bird is often seen under feeders. Rock pigeons are your classic city bird. Um, they were once one of the most common birds raised by humans for meat and eggs. And while they aren't often kept for those reasons anymore, they've become really well adapted to living around humans. Here's a group that's a little more uncommon to see in Indiana, and that is the pheasants and the quail. While the ringneck pheasant isn't a native bird species, they were brought to the U.S. for hunting, it can often be spotted in grassland areas. The northern bobwhite is also seen in grassland or prairie areas, although they are currently at historically low numbers since much of their preferred habitat has been turned into agricultural fields. But if you're near a large prairie and you keep an ear open, uh, maybe you'll hear the ringing hey bob white call as you walk around. Our next family is one that everybody loves to see, although you're more likely to hear these guys, and that is the owls. So the barred owl is a medium-sized owl. It has very dark eyes, unlike some of the other species we see. Um, it prefers to hunt in mature woods. Uh, these guys are mostly nocturnal, but they can actually sometimes be spotted awake and hunting during the day as well. The great horned owl is our largest owl species. So the great horned owl is an absolutely massive bird. And notice those massive feathered feet and claws for catching their prey and the horns, which are actually tufts of feathers. You're most likely to hear this bird at night, uh, giving a deep rhythmic hooting. So your classic owl call. Now the hummingbirds are our smallest bird species in Indiana. While we occasionally see vagrants like the Anna's hummingbird we talked about earlier, only one species is common in Indiana and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird. So notice the bright ruby gorget or throat feathers on the male and that speckled feather throat on the female. Look for this bird visiting brightly colored native plants or at a backyard hummingbird feeder. And if you like to set up hummingbird feeders, now is the time. They're arriving usually in our area right around the 15th. So this is the perfect time to set up hummingbird feeders. They'll be arriving any day now. Next up are the woodpeckers, many of which are commonly seen visiting feeders throughout Indiana. These guys love eating feeder food. So the most common uh, that we see might be the little downy woodpecker. These guys love suet feeders. They're about as small as our woodpeckers here in Indiana get, and they're contrastingly colored black with white speckles, and the males have a bright red patch on the back of their head. The red-bellied woodpecker is named after that little tiny bit of red feathers on their belly, um, since we also have a red-headed woodpecker with a much more red head. These guys are really, really chatty birds and they can often be heard calling to each other um, from feeders or in mature forests where they like to nest. Our biggest woodpecker species is the pileated woodpecker. This bird is almost crow sized and it has a large powerful bill and red crest. Males of this species can be ID'd by their red mustache. So all the birds in this group can be seen climbing their way up and down the bark of trees, looking for insects and drumming with their very large powerful bills. And we have a few swallow species in Indiana, but these are two of the most common. Barn swallows with their dark backs and rusty bellies are often seen nesting in or around human buildings or like picnic shelters. Tree swallows, however, are cavity nesters, so they would prefer an old woodpecker hole to nest in. But you can watch them swooping and swirling above ponds catching bugs. While they both have really similar back colors, they're both kind of dark, it's that belly that tells those, these two birds apart rusty in the barn swallow and bright white in the tree swallow. Here the tail is a good clue as well. So while the tree swallow has that flat tail, the barn swallow has a really, really heavily forked tail. And that makes it relatively easy to tell these fast flying birds apart. Although I won't say too easy, they're still pretty difficult. Next up, we have some more common feeder birds. So all of these guys can be found in their preferred habitat, forests, but will often visit feeders, especially those with sunflower seeds or peanuts available. The Carolina chickadee is a very small perching bird with a solid black cap and throat. The tufted titmouse is very similar in size, but notice it's almost all gray body and cardinal-like crest. If you're out in the woods and you hear a bird calling Peter, 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 keep an eye out for these really curious, noisy birds. In this group, we also have the white-breasted nuthatch. This bird is most often seen clinging to the sides of trees, a lot like a woodpecker. 
Similarly, it also has a relatively long bill to forage for insects or steal peanuts from your feeders. Next up, we have the wrens, and we have two very common wren species in Indiana. That's the house wren and the Carolina wren. These guys are like the tiny dogs of the bird world. They're small, but they pack lots of furious personality. House wrens have a very loud burbling call, call and they will readily nest in backyard birdhouses. But be careful if you do put a house out, it's really important to make sure that the entrance to the house is wren size. Too large of a hole and other species will be able to get in. Carolina wrens are also seen nesting near human habitation, but they have no problem waiting for an open garage door to nest somewhere goofy, like inside an old container or box. Now, these guys may seem superficially similar to sparrows, but this group is almost always very round bodied, like a little ball with very stiff upright tails. That's the classic wren pose. Thrushes are a family of birds that are tons of fun to watch. So the wood thrush might be difficult to spot as it forages along the forest floor, but listen for a taunting ringing call in the spring. The Eastern Bluebird is another bird in this family that can be found in forests, but also have benefited greatly from birdhouses. In the late summer, the juveniles, when they're leaving the nest, um, and notice how different that little spotted baby is from its bright, bright blue and chestnut parent. Also in this family, a really common thrush that we don't have a picture of is the American Robin. Um, they're probably here now, eating lots of worms out of your front lawn, uh, and that is another bird in the thrush family. And next up we have the mimics. So while these birds aren't the most colorful, they make up for it with their really incredibly detailed songs. So both the Northern Mockingbird and the Gray Cat Bird are excellent mimics and will include other birds in their own songs. Um, the Mockingbird is often much more bold. It can be readily seen while the Cat Bird, which actually looks like this, they like to skulk around in really dense brush. So if you hear a meow coming from a nearby bush, it might not be a cat at all, but this shy mimic named for the noises they make. And now a family that everybody likes, the warblers. So the warblers are some of our most brightly colored and really exciting birds to see. The American red skirt and the black and white warbler are best seen in the spring and fall. Keep an eye out for that flashing tail of the red star while it tries to scare up bug seed. And keep an open ear for the squeaky wheel call of the black and white warbler. The yellow warbler is here nesting all summer. It's a very, very bright yellow gold bird. Females will often have a little chestnut streaking on their chest, but males like this one pictured here are often heavily streaked. The yellow rumped warbler, or maybe you've heard its nickname of butterbutt, uh, it can be seen during migration, um, but it will often spend its winter here as well. So one of the few warblers we have over the winter. And if you have ever heard a birder complaining of warbler neck in the spring, or maybe you'll experience it yourself, is because most of this family um, prefers to hang and forage out in the tallest trees possible. So sometimes it can be really difficult to get a good look at these birds. We're moving on to the cardinals and the tanagers, which are relatively closely related. And of the two groups, the, we most often see the scarlet tanager and the northern cardinal. The scarlet tanager is a relatively shy bird and can be kind of difficult to spot, even though it's relatively common in wooded areas and so brightly colored. You can ID this species from other Indiana tanagers, like the summer tanager, due to its darkly colored wings in both the male and the female. The Northern Cardinal, on the other hand, is a very bold, common backyard bird, and it loves to visit feeders. Males are bright red, while females are more brown, although both have black masks. Now the Juvenile Cardinal is completely brown, but it still has a mohawk, just like its parents. And notice too that the Juvenile Cardinals have a dark bill, which won't turn bright orange until its second year. So that can make them surprisingly difficult to ID if you see them at a feeder. Next, we have the sparrows, which is a notoriously difficult group to ID. The two we have here couldn't be more different, but often sparrows are relegated to the little brown job category. They're very tiny little brown birds and difficult to tell apart. But the dark-eyed junco on the left, this is our winter visitor, the snowbird. They spent their winters in Indiana visiting feeders before heading back north to breed in the spring. 
They're dark above with bright white bellies. And in flight, they'll actually flash their white outer tail feathers as they fly away, which can be really useful for identification. Probably our most common sparrow is the song sparrow, and it's brown and streaked all over. Now again, sparrow ID can be really tricky, but song sparrows will have chestnut streaks all over their body and often a solid mark right in the middle of their chest. Another great way to ID the sparrow is to make a note of the really trilling, long, rhythmic song. Another exciting family is the blackbirds and the orioles. So we have another brightly colored bird, the oriole. It loves to visit fruit and jelly feeders in the spring. Now the red-winged blackbird is usually found in marshes or wetlands, and they love to build their nests and vegetation over the water. These are some of the first breeding birds to arrive back in the spring. So you know spring has arrived when you hear them calling near your local pond or along the roadside. The males are unmistakable with their black feathers, their bright red shoulders, or what we call epaulets. But females can be really difficult. They look a bit like large sparrows. So in this case, when you see one of these birds, make a note of the habitat, the size, and the bill shape. So while similarly covered sparrows um, usually have very shorter, blunter bills, a female red-winged blackbird will have a very long, thin, and pointed bill. And finally, we have the finches. This is a really, really colorful, varied group. Most often we'll see house finches and goldfinches visiting feeders. While the purple finch here is a little less common. So house finch males will have a red hood that isn't found in the female, but both will have very heavy streaking. Purple finches on the other hand will have less streaking and be more purple, um, just like their name implies. Although females of both of these species can be really difficult to tell apart. For these guys, the house and the purple finches, time of year can help you with an ID. We generally don't see any purple finches in the summer. They usually stick to migration in the winter months, if we see them at all. Goldfinches are totally unmistakable with their striking gold and black wings, and in males, a black cap as well. In the winter, however, these guys can be surprisingly difficult to spot. So these birds molt out of their bright breeding plumage into a very drab brown plumage in the winter. So if you've ever wondered in the past where all your goldfinches have gone for the winter, they're probably still around. They just look very different. And that is all of our bird families in Indiana. Um, I really appreciate you guys joining and learning a little bit about where and when our most common birds can be found, how to tell some of them apart. I know this can be really daunting if you're just beginning your birding journey, but know that there are a ton of resources out there to help you learn your birds, whether you just love sitting and watching your feeders or you're thinking about maybe doing a big year. Um, I think we have plenty of time for questions, so I will pass it back over and uh, we can get some of those answered. Sure, it looks like we have one in the chat that says, are the birding seasons defined by the calendar? I can't read the other part. Uh, well, um, I would say yes. Uh, the birding seasons generally follow pretty closely um, to what we think of as spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, although there's almost always something going on. So even if there's not um, a big migration movement, often there's still some little movement. So there's always something to see no matter what season it is. If anybody else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and fire away, or you can use the chat, either one. Anybody? I have a question as far as bluebirds. Is the best food for them the, those um, dried mealworms? That is a really good way to get bluebirds at your feeder. They love those dried mealworms. Uh, if you're going to put them out, I recommend getting a mealworm feeder. So they actually have um, oh. little mealworm trays that have a cage surrounding them so the other birds can't really get to them. Um, and you'll get things like chickadees and titmice as well, but the bluebirds will really love, they're not a super common bird that comes to your feeder, but they will really come for those mealworms. Okay, thank you. Sure. Great question. Uh, here's one in the chat. Uh, 
Oh, a bunch are coming in. At the beginning of your presentation, you talked about the Mississippi something. Could you repeat that? Do you remember? Oh, sure. That? Yeah. So that is the Mississippi flyway. So across the North and South America, there are different migration paths that are called flyways. Um, there's usually people say four. Sometimes it's argued there's a couple more, but we are right in the middle of what's called the Mississippi flyway, which is actually one of the biggest. Where in the Indianapolis area is the, the best place or a good place to watch birds? Do you have a favorite spot? Um, so, I, you know, I actually haven't birded um, down this way very much yet. So I'm learning just myself. And I'm using a resource that we actually talked about early in the presentation, that um, Indiana bird watching trail. That is a really great spot. Um, it's got tons of sites all over Indiana um, and plenty near Indianapolis. So that's a really good place to go to... Um, to find a new place to bird. Any tips for keeping sparrows out of songbird houses? Vance is half one. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's really just no no solid way to do it. Um, there are lots of things that they sell online to put on the houses. Um, if you're going for runs and you make sure you have that smaller run sized hole. The sparrows generally won't be able to get in there, but the sparrows are a big problem. Um, and yeah, they're, they're tough. They're not native um, and they really do a number on our birds. Um, and I wish I had a perfect answer for you on how to, how to keep them out of the houses. But if you see them going in there and building a nest, feel free to pull the nest out. And uh, that's, that's really all we can do to try to protect our native nesters. Here's another one. We have masses of starlings that roost in our backyard every spring and fall. They're noisy and dirty. Any suggestions to get them to move on? Yeah, so that's another tough one. That's our other big non-native species. Um, you know, personally, like not in the wild, starlings are pretty cool birds. Um, they're mimics, just like those, those cat birds and the, the mockingbirds we talked about so these guys can actually learn to mimic human speech which was pretty cool and other bird calls um, but yeah it's not great when they're they're spending all of that time roosting in your yard um, I would recommend if you see them um, to just take down the feeders for a couple of days if you have feeders and just encourage them to move on mm. okay. do bird houses have to be cleaned each year or should they be left alone it's usually good practice to clean them out every year. Um, most of the birds, there are occasionally birds that will reuse nests or nesting locations, but for the most part, birds that nest in houses, it's a good idea to clean those things out. Um, if I like to have a bird book of backyard handy uh, around any recommendations. Hmm. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking for. The couple of guides that we talked about, the, um, the Sibley, the Peterson, and the Crossley, those are all really great uh, resources. Um, if you're looking for something that's more of a coffee table book, that's available too. I don't have any recommendations off the top of my head, but I know there's some really excellent, cool, cool books with fantastic pictures out there if you're looking for something a little more coffee table. Um, but those three books we talked about are all, are all excellent choices. Uh, here's one. Uh, I relocated from northern Indiana in a rural setting, always had Baltimore Orioles using grape jelly and oranges with so many trees in my area. And now is it possible to easily attract them in this setting? Yeah, um, it sounds like you're in a great area to attract them. I would say keep putting that jelly and the oranges out um, and they'll they'll see that color as they're migrating over. And I don't think you'll have any problem getting them back. Um, uh, someone would like you to repeat the names of the books again. Oh, so we have the, um, the Peterson guide to birds of, um, I think it's just birds of Peter Peterson birding guide. Um, and let's see, I can even maybe go back to that slide. Ooh, okay. So here we have the, Let's see, the Peterson Field Guide to Birds. That's it. Uh, Roger Torrey Peterson, a pretty famous birder. Uh, really good, solid choice if you're just getting into birding. Um, this is a lot of people's first field guide. Uh, we have the uh, Sibley Birds East. So if you're looking at books, um, often there will be 
a Sibley Birds of the U.S. And then they'll also have smaller books that are East and West. And if you're looking at books, um, either get the, the full one or just the East is a really good way to narrow it down. Then the third one we talked about was the Crossley ID guide. Um, this is more like real pictures of birds instead of uh, art depictions, um, but they're all really excellent choices. Mm. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Should I use bleach to clean the birdhouse? Oh, you can, um, especially if it's in between birds using it. It's usually recommended to clean houses and feeders. Um, semi-regularly with a very small amount of bleach is a good way to, to clean those out. You don't have to use it to clean houses, um, especially if it's porous wood, um, but it, it's a good idea to, to scrub those houses out a little. They can get, after a nesting season, they can be a little rough in there. So it's, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> We're up to date on the chat, so if anybody has uh, any other questions, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask away. We've got a few more minutes. How do you get multiple hummingbirds to share feeders? They seem territorial. <laughs> hummingbirds are very territorial. And for <laughs> such a tiny bird, they just, again, tiny, tiny dog energy. <laughs> um, they just really, really will protect those feeders. From other hummingbirds and large birds, I've seen a hummingbird uh, dive bomb a red tail hawk that clearly wasn't interested in the feeder at all, but very territorial. Um, I would recommend if you really want to get lots and lots of hummingbirds to have multiple feeders and to set them relatively far apart. Um, mm. And because they're so territorial, one of those big feeders with 10 holes in it probably mm. isn't going to be used by 10 hummingbirds. So your best bet mm. for lots of hummingbirds is to do smaller feeders relatively far apart. Mm. Thank you. You're very welcome. Hmm. Uh, do bird experts expect the kind of bird disease we experienced at the beginning of the pandemic when we were told not to feed the birds? Yeah, so it's always a possibility that we'll see something like that again. Um, birds are migratory. They're spending a lot of time at our feeders in contact with each other. So that's always, that's always a possibility. Um, and then there's things like right now we're seeing birds have um, avian influenza. Uh, and it's very common in wild birds. Lots of ducks and waterfowl have this and never show symptoms. Um, but when it gets really heavy in a population, sometimes it will move to songbirds. And like we're seeing right now, um, people's personal chicken and duck and turkey flocks um, and feeder flocks. Um, so there are some diseases that we just always expect to be present in the, the populations, um, whether it's affecting how we feed birds is just just changes over time. We saw a pair of vultures in my father's yard. Where do they nest? Um, so often vultures will nest in uh, very, very, very large tree cavities. Um, like turkey vultures, I've seen them nest in a tree that partway fell over and got hollowed out a little. Um, and there was a turkey vulture nesting in it. Um, they don't often nest in tree, don't always nest in tree cavities, but I believe that's their preference. And I'm not actually sure about black vultures. I don't know where they like to nest. Hmm. How are bird families determined? I was surprised to learn that a robin is a thrush. Yeah, so um, that's actually changing all the time. If you get really into birds um, and you start following what's going on in the bird world. Um, bird groups are changing a lot and it's as we learn more about them genetically. Um, so we used to group birds by things like color and size and relationship to each other. And now that we're learning more about bird genetics, we're able to group them a little more accurately. Is it okay to feed wild ducks and geese with bread? So I won't say it's okay. It's not the best. Um, I know we've all done it uh, and we'll probably continue to do it. Um, but bread is not great for ducks and geese um, because they will fill up on it. They'll fill their crop up, um, which is where all their food goes before it goes into their stomach. Um, and sometimes that can cause problems if they eat a lot of dry bread and drink water. It can become impacted. 
Um, it can be not nutritionally great for de geese and ducks. So if you've ever seen a Canada goose um, with its wings looking kind of broken and sticking out at a weird angle, that's actually something called angel wing and it's a nutritional deficiency. Um, and it's also not great for the environment. So when we throw lots of lots of bread into, into the water, um, it can cause algae growth. Um, so we all do it. We all have bread on hand. We've all done it. Um, it's not ideal. If you're going to feed them something, um, even just bird seed, a little bit of like halved grapes, um, things like that are, are just better overall. How should I get started with feeders in my backyard? I have a small yard on a brook connecting two small ponds in a small zero lot line community. Mm, it sounds like you're in a great spot to start feeding. Um, there are a million types of bird feeders out there, right? Um, I would recommend if you're going to start with three bird feeders, I love to do a finch feeder. Um, so finches, they can eat from socks. Um, they'll there's feeders out there where the hole is actually below the pin for them to perch on so they can hang upside down. Um, and those, those feeders with a really tiny black thistle seed are really fun for finches. Uh, I like to do, instead of your typical bird feeder, um, a platform feeder, and they're still hanging. There's just small little squares and they allow bigger birds to be able to perch on them, stuff that wouldn't be able to perch on your regular feeder. So I like those. And I also would do a suet feeder. Suet is a fantastic way to bring birds like the downy woodpeckers in and your different woodpeckers, but you'll also see things like nuthatches and chickadees and all kinds of things will eat suet, especially during the winter when they're looking for extra energy sources. So those three are really good, good place to start off. I have the Merlin app on my phone to identify sounds and bird types. Are there any other apps you would recommend to identify birds? So the Merlin app is a fantastic place to start. Um, I always tell people that it's the beginning of your identification and not the end. So it gives you a fantastic place to start, but make sure that you're, you're verifying yourself and looking in your bird guides and, and seeing if you're correct. Um, Along with the Merlin bird ID, um, I would recommend maybe the Sibley or the Peterson app. Both of those are really, really good bird apps. Um, and both of those can be automatically updated to your location and the time of year, which can be fantastic when you're getting into birding. And then of course, I always recommend eBird. So eBird is a really great way. It's not an identification app, but it's a really fun way of keeping track of um, what birds you're seeing at a location. Um, it can help you find new spots to bird. And it will help you keep your life list. So if you really get it really into birding, every new bird you see is a lifer. Um, and it's a really fun way to keep track of your life list. Okay, we've got two more quick ones. Uh, how long is bird seed good for? So bird seed, um, generally, if you have good birds coming and they're coming in regularly, you don't, they'll eat it quicker before it goes bad. Um, it's usually recommended to uh, dispose of bird seed after say a really heavy rain if it doesn't dry out quickly it could start to go moldy um, and then it just depends on the type of feeder too so if your bird seed is in a tube feeder where the birds can't access all the seeds at once it might stay um, a little fresher for longer than if you had a platform feeder and they're stepping on it and pooping in it um, so generally I would say as long as the weather's good and you have that type of feeder yeah, uh, you're good to go until they empty it, but keep an eye out in case any mold starts growing or it gets a little wet. How high should bird feeders be? How do you keep squirrels out? So you could really go with any height of bird feeder. Um, there are birds that if you put seed on the ground, um, they'll prefer to, to eat on the ground. Um, and then there, there are feeders that are, can be 10 feet high and birds will eat from those too. Um, but really anywhere is a great place to get different types of birds. So some birds like juncos, you'll very, very rarely see on a feeder, but they will visit the ground underneath the feeders. Um, so putting feeders at different heights is a great way to see different types of birds. Uh, keeping squirrels out is always a little difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend things like baffles on the poles. Um, you can get uh, feeders that are inside of cages so the squirrels can't get at the feeder inside the cage but the birds can um, and some of us have just accepted the fact that we're also feeding squirrels <laughs> so it's, it's really just how hard do you want to fight fight the squirrels yeah, it's a difficult one 
All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Libby. Uh, it was a great program, very informative. Uh, we hope to see everybody in two weeks on Wednesday, April 27th uh, at 10 a.m. Mm. And for the bird walk. Um, so check your email. You'll get a notification with more information as we get closer. Uh, and then this program has been recorded, so it'll be posted online tomorrow via our website. So if you want to rewatch or uh, you can just access it that way. So thank you very much. Hope everybody's safe tonight and we'll hope for good weather in a couple weeks. And thanks again. Let be great program. Thank you very thank much. You so I was much. very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>